<laughs> so wonderful to see you. Welcome to this event, Unite for Mission 2025. Hold We're on. excited to see so you. So nice to see you because we usually don't see you. We don't you. see you. Yeah, it normally feels like we're talking just to ourselves, sitting in our room. So having people in front of us is very exciting. If we get a bit excited, that might be why. Um, who has heard of the podcast Outrage and Optimism? All right. So this is a live recording of the podcast, and we're going to need your help, OK, to kick us off. So I'm going to say hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Rivik Karnak. My name is Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. And we're coming to you live from New York Climate Week. And that's your moment, OK? We need a big cheer. Let's try. Let's practice. We're coming to you live from New York Climate Week. <laughs> All right. So we are ready for the music. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivik Karnak. I'm still Cristiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. And we're coming to you live from New York Climate Week. <laughs> All right. Tom. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. We love you. We really appreciate it. Now, the next 45 minutes are going to be a whistle-stop tour of everything that's been happening as we build momentum in this most critical of weeks. It's been an amazing week in many ways. We've seen the pact of the future. We've seen incredible momentum. The evidence for economic transformation is everywhere. But there's also this sense of nervousness. We know that time is running on, and we're not yet where we need to be. So what do you think of this week so far? Do you want the politically correct answer or do you want the real answer? We want the Christiana answer. Okay. That would be the real answer. Okay. Okay. So you two know me well enough to know that I don't really do like big things with lots of people and dinners and all of that. It's just not my thing. So my preference, of course, is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations where can, I can actually be listening to the person who's speaking. However... So that is not exactly the definition of climate week, would you agree? Now, what I was thinking is, this is a really interesting place to go to pick up the new lingo that is developing here in the community. And I remembered this morning that the first time that I ever heard the word intersectionality was here at a climate week, I don't know how many years ago, but did you, or do you also remember hearing it here for the first time being used on different stages, or did you hear it elsewhere? Heard it here? Well, this morning, I was given another new word that apparently is like the word in Climate Week. Biofi. Oh, I'm so glad. So You're ahead of the curve, new, Christiana. It is new it, to yeah. you too, right? OK, well, I will spill the beans later about what biofi is, but just make sure that you know what it means before you leave New York, because otherwise you're going to fail the test of Climate Week, OK? You're, you're not telling us what it is? No, not yet. All oh, right, OK. Well, everyone can Google it, and then they'll know Google later. it. All right, yeah. PD? What can I say? I mean, it's so energizing to be at Climate Week. I'm so sorry that you're in the world's largest gathering of a million, billion, trillion people, and it's not the ideal place. But it's great, the energy. However, context, we know extreme weather. Everyone's got the memo. Billions of people around the world. You know that joke? Like, if it's true in reality, it must be true in theory. So we've got uh, every reason to sort of have a, an understanding. And yesterday I heard a definition of optimism from Jacinda Ardern. She said it was maintaining expectations. Hmm. And that's uh, a choice, right? Despite failures. Despite failures. That's the important Maintaining part. expectations despite failures. OK. It's a choice, but it's also a duty. And I think the Mission 2025 is perfectly expressing that with a collaboration of the energy of subnational governments and corporations and investors and scientists and youth getting together, pulling their sleeves up. That's a working, strong look, by the way, isn't it? Yeah, working yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on fixing that's stuff, right. which is okay. the next iteration. So that's right. my climate week. Very good. I love it. OK, so we are now going to go. What's yours? Mine? Yeah. Well, I said, I mean, it's, it's like the best of times and the worst of times. It's so often the case, right? I mean, that beautiful first line of, of A Tale of Two Cities. If you look at the momentum, the pact of the future, all these things that came out of this week, I've been in so many rooms where you talk about this, the exponential curve, right, which everyone's doing all the time, about this transformation that's unfolding. And if you're not paying attention to what's happening to people around the world, to extreme weather, 
Well, if you're not concerned about it, you're not paying attention. So both are happening at the same time. Now, we're going to introduce our first speaker, who's the only one who stands here and actually gives remarks. After that, we're going to talk to people. These two haven't modeled being brief very well. They've talked a bit longer than they were supposed to. So speakers, this is going to be tight. And this person has been described to me three times this week as having the most difficult job in the world. But Christiana, is being executive secretary of the UNFCCC really that hard? Oh, it's a yeah. piece of cake. <laughs> piece of cake. Paris, yeah. So we are uh, thrilled to have Simon Steele here. But I have to tell you, one of my least favorite moments in the build-up to Paris was having to go to today King Charles, then Prince Charles, to tell him in person, Majesty, I am so sorry that you will only have three minutes to address the plenary in Paris. To which he responded, but you know that I have prepared a 13 minute speech. I knew that, that's why I went to tell him that he only had three minutes. And I also knew that he had practiced the 13 minutes. So the next 20 minutes were convincing him why he had to actually cut it down. And I asked for Simon's forgiveness because I've had to do it again just five minutes ago and tell Simon, you don't have a whole six minutes. Can you cut it down? So Simon, where is he? Right I am, <laughs> I beg for your forgiveness, but you're in good company with King Charles. Simon Steele, Simon Executive Steele. Secretary of the UNFCCC. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm certainly, certainly not King Charles. So if he can do it, I'm sure I should be able to give it a, a, a good shot. But Christiana, Tom, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you all today. And today's discussion about ambition loops is more timely than ever. And it's not just timely, it's absolutely essential. These ambition loops are where government leadership meets real economy transformation. Done well, the plans, the NDCs, which are at the heart of what is being asked of parties this year and next year, done well, these plans will be powerful blueprints for stronger economies and societies. They're the most important policy documents of this century because they will be key determinants in whether economies flounder amid spiraling climate impacts or flourish by riding the epic wave of global decarbonization, bringing every sector on board. To get there, we need a, B, an ABC of NDCs, where A, is for ambitious new emission targets that are economy-wide, covering all greenhouse gases and keeping 1.5 alive. B is by being broken down into sectors and gases. And C, they have to be credible, speaking to substantive regulations, laws, and the funding to ensure that these goals are actually implemented this time round. So done right, these plans can unlock the greatest trans transformation of the global economy that we've ever seen. A real opportunity, which makes it among the greatest commercial opportunities of our time. Something no investor, certainly no politician, should choose to ignore. The dividends for businesses, investors, subnational governments are monumental. But they're only just starting to flow and only flowing to some. It's clear that many vulnerable and developing countries are being deprived and are being held back. That's why major progress on climate finance is so urgently needed, both at COP29 in Baku, as well as outside of the COP process. This is where your role is so incredibly important on two fronts. First and foremost, 
making the case to governments of why bold is entirely in their own interests because of the huge benefits for their economies and people. And those opportunities are for the taking with stronger growth and productivity, more jobs, higher wages, better quality jobs, less pollution, better health, more affordable and secure energy, more stability, and equality and empowerment for women. On both the supply side and the demand side, we need stronger, more consistent policies that simply cannot be ignored. New data released today shows how better policies can unlock a tsunami of investments. And secondly, I urge you to keep thinking bigger and to go beyond. Think bigger in terms of what credible and ambitious transition plans can deliver. In terms of business transformation, seizing early mover advantages, empowering your people, unlocking new markets and growth potential. And go beyond by working right across your supply chains, including SMEs. SMEs are the quiet powerhouse of almost every G20 economy with carbon footprints and climate vulnerabilities to match. So bringing SMEs from the margins of climate action into the center can be a game changer, which will pay huge dividends at all levels, individuals, local, national, and global. So I'm wrapping up here. So going beyond also applies to your advocacy. Many business here at Climate Week have a global footprint, and it's G20 economies that most need are uh, needed to move um, the fastest. Where you can open doors, I urge you to do so. Raising the volume, privately or publicly, or both, just make noise. It's essential if we are to get climate action back to the top of the political agenda. I know many in this room are already industry leaders. So I commend you for your tireless efforts and I urge you to take them to the next level and to bring others along with you. So yes, tackling the challenge is crucial, but so too is telegraphing your successes. Show your peers and your policy makers that bold climate action is good for everybody's business. So Christiana, I hope that shrunk this down to maybe a little over three minutes, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> All right. Much more time to cut down his speech than Simon, so thank you very much, Simon. Really appreciate that. Um, Jennifer, can I invite you up? There you are. Um, Jennifer? You used to sit on the other side of all of this conversation, on the civil society side, yep. and you're now on the government side. We've just heard from Simon that he thinks that governments need to hear much more noise. From your side, sitting in the government seat, what kind of noise, message, signal, do governments need to hear to do what Simon has just said, the ABC? What do you need to hear? We need to hear about how the impacts, the climate crisis, are impacting your supply chains. But I would say I want to be specific about the we, the finance ministers. We need you to be engaging with your finance ministers, your economic ministers, your heads of state. What does the climate crisis, the impacts that are happening now, mean for your supply chains and your ability to deliver? Number two, we need you to come in and say, you know, I want to come and invest. Germany, we had a 64% increase in investment in renewable energy in one year in, last year, right? And that Woo! is also why we heard we need long, loud legal signals for that kind of uh, investment. So we need your voices with economic ministers, with heads of state to say, it's in our interest, we want to come and invest. But we need those clear signals in those national climate plans, those NDCs. And I would say, third, we need you on the halls of, in the halls of parliament. 
We need you in, not only in your boardrooms, we need you in the heads of state rooms. We need you in our public media. We need you in our public debates to bring these voices in because I know we're here about optimism, Christiana, but it's a battle and we know it. And last year we had a win. We had a transitioning away from fossil fuels and a tripling of renewables and a doubling of efficiency. That woke a few people up to say, aha, it is happening, and now they're pushing back hard. So we have to be louder. We have to be clear. We have to build power, and that's why we need you. Thank you, Jennifer. You've heard it. <laughs> Tim. Tim, could I invite you? You just heard what Jennifer defines as policy. From your research, what else is needed on the policy side to actually accelerate what we need? Is that going to be enough? In simple terms, Christiana, we need decisive mandates for the end of fossil fuel technologies that are going to be the crucial thing to stimulate the clean technologies we need, and particularly the positive tipping points. You, have to, you have to define what decisive mandates, because yeah. there are many countries that would interpret that in quite a variety of ways. So, to be clear, we're talking about, uh, in a study we launched yesterday, we're talking about phase out of coal power stations in developing developed nations by 2035 and in developing nations by 2045. We're talking about mandating no petrol and diesel car sales from 2035. We're talking about mandating all heating appliances for buildings being heat pumps from 2035 and all trucks to be electric powered from 2040 because it's these kind of decisive mandates that are the most effective at stimulating the innovation, the learning by doing, the economies of scales, the crucial amplifying feedbacks that create the self-propelling change that we need to halve greenhouse gas emissions within the remaining five and a bit years of this decade. So basically you're recommending an expiration date. You're saying governments should come out here and say, this is the expiration date for using fossil fuels in cars. This is the expiration date for using fossil fuels in trucks, in, in the power sector. That is what you want. You want clear expiration dates. Some countries are already doing that. Absolutely, Christiana. But it's as you said it yesterday, we need to take the stabilizers off. These are mature technologies. We know they're better, cleaner, healthier alternatives. We need decisive leadership to set that clear path. It's, we're not saying that subsidies and taxes aren't also playing a role and aren't effective, but what we are able to show is that these, the, the tipping points that these policies will trigger it reinforce each other. So batteries that come out of electric vehicles and go onto the grid, they reinforce the tipping point to renewable power and so on. And we need those cascades of positive tipping points to have any hope of the acceleration in action we need to, to halve those greenhouse gas emissions in five and a bit years. So since I'm no longer executive secretary, I can now move into even more uh, unpolitically correct language. Um, and it just, strikes me, and I shared this with you yesterday, Tim, that the fact is that over the past nine and a half, almost 10 years since the Paris Agreement, since we have a very clear decarbonization goal, net zero by 2050, governments as a whole, what they've been doing is they have been putting training wheels on the decarbonization effort. And thanks to the training wheels, we now know how to decarbonize the power sector. That's the one that is, uh, using less support of your feed. We now know how to decarbonize the light transport, even the heavy transport, getting to other sectors. But the problem is, if we continue to use the training wheels, we're not gonna learn how to ride the bike properly. So it's time to take the training wheels off. And only governments can do that. Only governments can move from subsidies and incentives and all of that to clear mandates. Is that what we're saying? That's certainly what we're saying, but remember, we the people can give a popular mandate to leaders to show the resolution they're going to need to resist the lobbying that's going to want to erode those decisive mandates. And we, the companies, are already, some of you, thank you, out there, making the coalitions that are committing to buy 100% or make 100% renewable energy, 100% EV fleets. 
those send clear signals and they set up a feedback loop between the bottom up, if I can call it that, we the people and the top down of governance. And we need that align alignment, that coordination to further accelerate change. And that's exactly what we've seen as the secret for the case studies we already know Norway's tip to EVs, the UK shut down coal power. It's all about that coalition of action. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're both coming up together. I love that. Okay. So, you have heard. Thank you, both of you. You have heard what, uh, what the executive secretary expects, you've heard a voice from government and you've heard the voice from, uh, let's say, academic research. Now, the question to you. Does this give you a tingling of hope? Does it give you confidence or something in between? Or what else do we have to add to this? I think we're ready to take action ourselves. So we heard about Oh, we need uh, people in the parliamentary halls. We need to, you know, we need to have people in the governments. I'm saying that young people need to be a part of the governments. We need to stop asking them, and we need to have them as a part of decision making, so that we are able to tackle the kind of leadership crisis we're seeing today for the mandates that we're looking for. So, uh, I run the Youth Negotiators Academy, where we redress the systemic inequality of young people's representation at the decision-making tables by training them, by giving them the skills knowledge network to potentially develop their leadership skills, but also by give, get, making sure that by working with the governments directly with the UNFCCC focal points, we get them access as decision makers, a seat at the table. So this year we're training young negotiators for 63 countries, uh, almost 200 negotiators, and we're hoping that this would change everything that we're talking about today. Okay, Jonathan. I love that, and Christiana, one of the things that really, um, really uh, brings my admiration to you is that stubborn optimism lens that you have. I'm from Brazil, and in Brazil we have the saying, Brasileiro não desiste nunca, which is Brazilians never give up. So we have that resilience. Wait, in you the have to say that slowly because we're going to all have to memorize this for next year, okay? In Portuguese? Yes, in Portuguese. Brasileiros não desistem nunca. Brazilians never give up. So this is the thing, right? People in the global south, in Latin America, we're resilient because we have to be. And so really for me, I really think it's about bringing that optimism lens even when we don't have a lot of hope. I started my activism at COP21 when I, in 2015, so I feel like it was a really good time for diplomatic convergence, as you obviously know. Lots of things were happening. There was good momentum, optimism. And I think we kind of lost that a little bit, you know, with the threats to democracy, the very tricky elections we saw in, in Brazil, in the US, in so many countries. And so I think Mission 2025 is about bringing that back, planting those seeds again. And there's a quote from the Hamilton musical that I really like that says, you know, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. And so climate mitigation and the NDCs is really about bringing the, that legacy, planting those seeds. But honestly, again, as in the Global South, we also need to see that flowery garden as soon as we can. So bring that climate adaptation. So I really hope that with those NDCs, we can see more ambitious goals, more urgency, as the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC said. It's about changing the business as usual, being bolder, doing better, doing bigger. And so I hope that we get to see that and count on the youth to do that because that energy, that optimism is, is really big in us because it's not just our future, right? It's our present. So let's plant those seeds and build that legacy. Thank you. Tom, do you want to take over? Oh, thank you very much. That was great. Fabulous. All right. So we're going to talk now about business and finance and what it's going to take to scale things from where we are right now. So Vishali, please come and join me. Gunter, please join me on the stage. Um, yes, please. OK, so Vishali, I would love to start with you. Welcome. Um, you're doing incredible work scaling solar. The simple question is, might not be a simple answer, what does it take to scale 10 times more than where you are right now? It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and congratulations on this fabulous platform. Uh, let me tell you the 10x journey in India. Um, the renewable energy capacity in uh, India's uh, energy mix has grown in the last 10 years from 15% to 33%. 
uh, Renew, which is a company which Sumant, my husband, and I started about 10 years ago. We've uh, put 10 gigawatts on the ground, uh, making us the largest renewable energy company in India. The question is, how did this happen? Um, a couple of things. One is the enabling renewable energy policies like the national solar mission, the national hydrogen mission, a lot of production linked incentives to sort of you know, make in India and you know, do our own panels and so on and so forth, not only for India, but for the world. Um, led to our 10x journey from zero to 10 gigawatts. Um, it also attracted and incentivized other players to come into India and competition and more projects on the ground and growth happened. Now, how can we take this small example of a 10x to beyond us? Mm. So a couple of phase again. Um, I think um, uh, one is uh, really a question of uh, de-risking capital, which happened in India. We, uh, it was done uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, we set up SECI, which is a nodal agency for bidding, mm -hmm. which was the first of its kind. So a lot of innovation and policy making, which led us to, um, I guess, create more transparency and have more bankable projects, which again was a mobilizer for uh, us. Then also we have the largest uh, electricity transmission grid, uh, which was also a help. Now the thing is, how do we take this beyond uh, us to the uh, to scale? Um, I would say there are ten bold steps we can take, and I'll tell them okay, very quickly. They're going to have to be like very that. Quickly, if you're going to go so there's one steps. is I right, think just yeah. policies. Okay. I think we've been. Uh, lucky to have a government which is focused on building renewables with a 500 gigawatt uh, um, target, uh, but we need to engage subnational uh, okay. governments a lot right. more. That's one. Uh, we need better land acquisition policies. That will be a real accelerator. Uh, encourage uh, new technologies like green hydrogen, etc. Policies for that. Supply chain, super critical for us, larger companies, to invest in the smaller companies out there to make sure that we help them decarbonize as well. We need, uh, of course, skilling and innovation. We need more women. And people say there's a shortage of manpower. Enormous number of women out there who are ready to go to work. We must in include them in the sector because they're the ones who really suffer from the impacts of climate. Capital, we've talked about enough, so I'll save some time there. Uh, I think blended finance, philanthropic capital, so um, uh, encouraged to see what's happening uh, in the climate week with a lot of uh, active philanthropic capital, which is super critical. Collaborative work, none of us can do this alone. Um, very important is the mindset uh, shift which we are talking about. I think institutions have been engaged a lot, whether it's international, whether it's governments, whether it's corporates, but we really need individual engagement as well. Because you know, if I believe as a professional in the sector, I'm passionate and committed to climate change and sustainability, I'll go that extra mile at work to support such policies as a CFO or a CSO. So we do need that mindset shift to make this movement a one which is at an individual level, not only for us, but as we all know, it's for our children and theirs. So we are Amazing. deeply committed to get on to the 10x journey. And I was counting, that was 10. That was very <laughs> was good. I'm very impressed you did that. <laughs> Amazing. Round of applause, please, for Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. So, Gunter, we have known each other for a long time. We've always been so impressed with the work you've done the Asset Owners Alliance. You work at Allianz. What is it going to take to 10x the deployment of capital into the solutions? Yeah, the 10x. Let me first start about the baseline. We are uh, 88 investors. We are 10 trillion uh, of total uh, volume that we manage. Mm -hmm. And we have reported last year minus 2% absolute emissions down in that portfolio. This year, we report in our progress report, October it will come, but I can tell you now, minus 6%. Annual basis, 10 trillion, minus 6% absolute emissions down. That's where we start. Minus 6%, just to remind you, is very, very much on the scientific pathway down to minus 50% by 2030. Mm -hmm. It is. So there are investors who can do this. Now the 10x. Yeah. The 10x thing. We have heard by Simon, um, he, that was the ABC, you remember the B, the breakdown. He was talking about how do we bring these NDCs together with these investors. The investors who are far away from these NDCs. There is this gap. The breakdown was one thing that Simon mentioned. The NDCs must be detailed. Yes, I fully agree. Governments should really be thinking about three networks. Energy, transportation, information. There should be clear plans how these things look like in 2030. And the moment you have this, governments should then talk, what are the investments that come up along those three? 
and more for the transformation. Why should they do this? Because they know there are investors like us who really care for this climate impact management. They do minus 6% across their portfolios. May I translate? If you do minus 6% across your portfolio, this means you are heavily investing into the transformation. What else should you do if you want to have minus 6% of emissions? So these investors are there. They have the plans. There's only one step missing. Governments must institutionalize how they work with financial markets. Why is that? If they don't do this, they don't reap the enormous benefit of this economic opportunity. The fancy thing is governments sit on the economic transformation, have NDCs, but not the detailed plans. And interestingly, many governments have nobody who cares for auctioning out this enormous opportunity while investors are sitting and waiting to invest into it. Mm. So there is a chance to really close this gap with actually fairly, fairly trivial and easy means. If you tell me, no, 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 this auctioning out we have never heard about, just think about the permissions to build windmills onshore or offshore. Every country, we heard about Germany today, every country has auctioned out these permissions. Why not auction out the entire transformation and reap the benefit as a government? Why wouldn't you do this? All right, love it. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. Intersection, government and business. Paul, over to you. Helen, Peter, two of my favorite people. I'm having a kind of an enormous kind of crush and little moment. Um, I'll start with you, Peter. We met in 2008. You were running a huge company, buying airplanes, shipping things around the world. Now you run a coalition of enormous companies. What are your members doing to solve problems and kind of unstick the transition? Well, I think w the world of business is in a moment of pragmatism. It is uh, really taking a photo of what is happening in science and how does that translate into risk in supply chains. And that is creating a business case that we haven't seen before because you may not know, but many supply chains in the world within five to 10 years will lose all its earning capacity. Those are messages that need to be brought to boardrooms. Then obviously it drives into innovation agendas. And then the third powerful link is the accountability. Because ISSB, CSRD, and whatever other frameworks will be rolled out, that will make crystal clear who's moving, who's not moving and where the leaders will emerge. And just a little bit more on supply chains. Where are the hits going to be for the business people in the audience? Where to, look, where, where to, where to fear? Well, first and foremost in the, in the land-based uh, sectors, uh, you know, companies that have done the work in agriculture where water stress, uh, weather events, droughts are completely impacting the yield and therefore will drive commodity prices up and kill P&Ls, and that's now happening. And this is, this is not end of the century stuff like some of the science predictions. This is five to 10 years out. Wow, okay, scary. <laughs> now my favorite subject. I'm so glad to ask you of all people my favorite subject. What can or should or are leading investors, leading corporations doing to sort of support government and to help in this process? Very simpler, sim similar to what uh, Gunther was saying. Yes, we need NDCs, and yes, they need to be more ambitious, but we need to make the link into the real economy. We need to make sure that whatever a country promises is being backed up by transition plans, implementation plans, investment funds by, by investors to really drive this transition on the ground. So this, in, in yesterday we had a massive meeting where I basically said, we don't need more promises, we don't need more targets, we need implementation plans that are really government, investors, business-led. That's a beautiful thought. That's a truly beautiful thought. And, and my last question really is, where have you seen that happen? Or have you got any hints? If there's someone listening here who wants to like, make that happen, how do they go about it? Yeah, the, Germany has been mentioned. I don't know why Germany is at the center of today, but I had a meeting this morning. Power lines are being constructed here in the US. The permit time takes 16 years because individuals can protest and basically stop the project. In Germany, after the, the gas crisis, the law has been changed, and all of a sudden, public interest goes above personal interest. 
So if you have a power line that you need to construct or a renewable energy, then all of a sudden you can put them in much faster. And that type of collaboration is what we need. Public interest policy. Thank you. Helen, you do know how to throw a party, if you don't mind me saying so. Uh, I'm here to give you an award from the US Hotel Association, so thank you very much indeed, for 15 years of bringing the entire world to New York, and uh, you'll have the freedom of the city. Um, but seriously, I want to talk to you about um, something you know more about than anyone, perhaps, or and your members, and that's subnational governments. How are subnational governments showing up in this debate, and how are they contributing, and, you know, because people don't talk about them enough, so what's, what's the story? No, they're, they're sort of... A layer, for Brits it works to talk about the marzipan layer, but I think that only works in Brits. So the bit between the icing and the rest of the cake, this layer of government okay. that translates down from national level policies into a lot of the work. And I think one of the issues we've had over the years is, you know, the parties to um, COP and the, the agreements are the national level governments, but so much of this transition work has to happen at the local level, whether that is state and regional governments or with cities, we hear a lot about. And so we've been doing work, along with colleagues from C40 and Global Covenant of Mayors, forming this thing called CHAMP. Climate people love an acronym. That's CHAMP. CHAMP, the Coalition for High Ambition Multi-Level Partnerships. I have to use my hand. Yeah. For that. And really what that's saying is getting national governments to sign up to say, yes, we will collaborate with our subnational partners in order to deliver. Because the subnational governments are ready to deliver. They're very ambitious, a lot of them. But what's been happening, you know, you think about the UK, it comes along, negotiates, goes home and says, right, Scotland, get on with it. And, you know, maybe you need to be more ambitious and sort of setting it. So how do you have much more of a dialogue between these different levels of government so that we can get the implementation done? I mean, this was my next question, in a sense, was how the subnationals fit into government. Um, I mean, the MDC, is there like a sort of, you know, some minister somewhere who's got like a, you know, a, a staff that do an MDC? How, how should a government approach broadening that process? And separately, of course, your membership includes many corporations, many investors like Peter. Um, how, because you said it perfectly, you've got to get everyone together, right, around the table. But how is that happening? And, so and, and what's, the, what's the sort of secret source for doing more? I think it's not there yet, but it's starting, so through these sorts of things. So last year at the COP, we had this local climate action summit, it was called, and our members are saying, we want to be in the room, we want to be in the room. And I said, are you, are you sure you want to be in the room? Like, it's not that necessarily fun in the room. Um, but they were creating a sort of event and a bringing together to be able to be much nearer and sort of bring the action. But we're trying to really close that gap and take those messages to and from what's happening at the national level and the international level back down to that local level for the implementation. The big thing missing, and you're hearing it from everyone, is the finance. And that's where I think this year at the COP, we've really got to look at that innovation that brings the finance down to the level where the implementation is happening. Because it's everyone's ready to go on this, and so it's really about how do we make sure that we can connect. Yeah. That's part of our job. Cheeky question in 40 seconds. Go I on. mean, if you had like carbon taxes or subsidies or Inflation Reduction Acts or whatever, you know, doesn't the money just kind of flow? Isn't it policy-driven money? Or Yeah, I mean, so climate group, we believe very strongly in, um, in policy and regulation. I've been talking all week about, you know, it's not very sexy to say, yeah, regulate, but businesses, you know, are ready and just they, what they want is a level playing field. And so actually what they don't like is regulation sort of coming with one government, going with the next government. If we can set out the rules of the road, and that's why what we do with our business members is sort of aggregate that demand-side voice, but take it to policymakers in country and say, look, it's this specific tiny weird regulation you've got that's actually inhibiting all this potential investment. Unblock the future. Thank you both very much. So we started today off with the executive secretary and then, of course, how do we bookend? We invite the two incoming presidencies, of whom you see only one here, but the other one walking through the door. Bienvenida. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Lovely. How's that for perfect timing? <laughs> no, tranquila, tranquila. So, um, how delightful. Um, and, and here's a challenge to both of you because you haven't, given that you have a few things to do this week, you haven't heard this conversation. But let me summarize for you in two words. Defiance and optimism is what I hear here. 
Defiance because we can't take no for an answer. We're not going to bow to barriers and challenges, but also optimism that we can actually get over this to, uh, to do the job that needs to be done. So, Nigar, let me start with you because um, in about two and a half seconds, the COP is going to start. And, <laughs> and I, I just, I would love to know where are you now? What do you see? Uh, not just in the three seconds that you have left, but also how would you like the COP to end? What is the newspaper title that goes out to the world at the end of the COP? Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 47 days. I think we have 47 days to COP. And that's why, yes, it's, uh, it's like the time is flying. Well, what we want to see, we want to see consensus, and we want to see leadership from everywhere. So basically, it's just, it's a finance COP, but uh, it's not only up to the party. So we want to see whole of society approach, cities, private sector, civil society, academia, young people. So everyone need to be heard, and this is our role. So, and I think that the success is where we have that leadership, bold leadership from all the parties, from all the stakeholders, and we have that consensus on the climate finance. Well, that should be easy. <laughs> Are you sure that's it? Well, obviously not, but uh, well, if you ask me, I think that uh, we need to have uh, private sector leadership more because my role is the role of a champion which is which in this is just engaging with non-state actors. When we speak about non-state actors, the private sector, civil society, and cities, all the rest, philanthropies come come here, and we we want to see strong signals from the private sector that they are ready also to to be part of this conversation, that they are ready to commit, and they are ready to uh, to to be part of uh, climate finance talks. And Nigar, what if I told you that that is actually already the case? What if I told you that private sector and finance sector, those two, are actually at the table and actually wanting more certainty from governments? So when you say you want them at the table, I think they would say, we've been at the table for quite a while. When are governments gonna come to the table? Absolutely. It needs to be a very good dialogue between the governments and the private sector. And this is what we constantly hear from large companies, from SMEs, from everybody, that yes, Business people, entrepreneurs need to be incentivized. They, they need to believe into green tr transition. And we they are actually sending strong signals to governments to make uh, commitments and to come up with ambitious NDCs. So there should be a both ways. Dialogue and cooperation um, are the key. OK, thank you. Anna, you have a few more minutes before we get to COP30. That's a good. Um, how would you like to take whatever is delivered at COP29 uh, and then pick it up in COP30? What, what is COP30 aspiration? So, hello, everyone. <laughs> We're glad you got here. Uh, that's it. We're, we're all in a hurry, but at the same time, we needed this internal peace uh, to move us forward. So thanking, uh, thank you for having us. First, success at COP29 is absolutely vital for the su success of COP30. It's, that's, that's why we're working together with Troika to accelerate especially more ambitious NDCs that we're hoping everybody is helping uh, to do. But I like the question about what's the headline just after. And I, um, I think the headline I would like to, to have after COP30 is that was a COP about implementation, implementation, and speedy implementation. I think we have a lot of promise at COP28. Many things have been agreed, and what we need now is implementation. And who implements? Subnational governments, private sector, obviously federal governments as well, and we need to work together to speed up and accelerate. So from, from Brazil, as an emerging country, uh, we know about all the comparative advantages of a country like Brazil that could become competitive advantage, but we haven't seen the investments coming. The signal from the economics, the economic sectors, is fundamental. So the headline I would like to see would be at COP30, the climate governance have finally engaged the economic governance to give us the direction on how to speed 
up and to scale up the actions that we need to have. Okay, thank you. I think that was not unpredictable and yet still to be delivered. Thank you very much to both of you. Paul and Tom. the end of our time. We have a couple more minutes, I think, but it's been very nice. It's one of the first times we've ever done a live podcast together. Um, thank you, everyone who helped us organize it. Well, you two it. already did a live podcast, but I'm the newbie on Well, the I did it, but then we brought Paul up at the last minute, which was always lovely to have him around. Um, <laughs> we do tease him, but we love him. I hope you know that. Yeah. Um, me, I'm wearing a suit and like a white shirt and black shiny shoes, and you're teasing me? <laughs> <laughs> there was a mix-up in the hotel with my laundry. So oh, I yeah, like, right, yeah, right, yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> so before we finish, we've got to ask the question, what do we leave this conversation with? What did we learn in the last hour? And what does the magic word mean? Mm. Ah, the magic word. The magic. Do you remember what the word is? I don't, but I know there was one. Do you yeah. remember what uh, the word Yes, word? of course I did, yes. Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> Always learn from the younger generation. So I learned this word from my daughter this morning, who is here because she's consulting to impact investment. And she told me that she is participating in quite a set of very cutting edge conversations here at Climate Week, which is delightful to know that they are, some people at least are cutting into new territory that hasn't been cut into yet. And the topic of all of those conversations is bio-fi. Now, the FI does not stand for fiction. It stands for finance. And it is the challenge that many people are taking on to themselves about how are we going to figure out the finance that needs to go into the biodiversity, into biological. That's why it comes from biological finance. And even more interestingly, the challenge that they're giving themselves is how does that finance that goes into natural resources, that goes into basically land use or oceans, how can it actually attain the localization, the specific the specificity that it needs to make sense and to be effective at the local level? So it's not about big global uh, uh, structures, it's about how do you make it have sense at the local level. That to me, is a new challenge that we have to move toward. And I was really so grateful that there are some people who are taking it on here at Climate Week. And so you can go home saying, you know what BioFi is. <laughs> we don't have the answers, but at least we know what the word means. <laughs> but also BioFi was right there. That's much nicer. They should have gone for BioFi. But anyway, BioFi. BioFi. I was corrected. I was corrected. <laughs> All right, OK. So, and this conversation? And this conversation, well, as I told Nigara and, and Anna when they walked in, I, I heard much welcome defiance, hmm. um, which is, you know, we're just not going to continue uh, to accept boundaries and, and barriers because simply we have run out of time. So I love that defiance. Um, and the fact that it's paired up with optimism that we're actually able to do this in time is sort of the way I think. All right, very nice. PD? Beyond finger pointing, right? We're not doing that anymore. Um, as we're thinking about NDCs developing, how can we collaborate to get NDCs that are super investable and talk about green jobs more? And I'm going to reprise my earlier little bit of mime. It's the sleeves rolled up. It's actually now working on problem solving and taking that spirit of problem solving all the way through the year and on the, on the policy thing, making the rules we need to finish the job. Love it. OK. And my final thought, I would say, is it's this, right? It's the intersection. It's actually every piece is now in place. The momentum is there. The economics are there. The ambition is there. It's the pieces coming together to influence each other. That's what Mission 2025 is about. That's what we want to do in the course of the next 18 months to get us to the point where we can scale up the NDCs. Everybody is needed for that. We're all in for that. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all the partners in the room. Thanks to the team who put this together. We love you. Please tune in next week. See you next Thanks week. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah.